and welcome to Activist Connect, a podcast seeking to engage, educate, entertain, and connect activists across the country. I'm Tiana. And I'm Isabella. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Yagara and Turrbal people as the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting in Brisbane today. And I would like to extend my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging from wherever you are listening from, and acknowledge that this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. As any activist would know, successful movements are powered and sustained by deep and empowering relationships between activists. This is why building a sense of community is so important in activism. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how you can better influence people in your community, how you can have more meaningful conversations, get more petition signatures and increase attendance at your events. We will also be talking about how you can build a stronger community of human rights defenders and ensure that your action group can withstand the changes that are occurring in civil society in general and particularly the voluntary sector. We recently sat down with Irina B, who has been teaching nonprofits how to tell their story for over 25 years in the media, social media and through events and direct engagement. Irina was the first communications director for the Queensland Community Alliance and Clean Energy Council. She was Communications Manager for Volunteering Australia and the Red Cross Blood Service in Victoria. She's advised the City of Melbourne, Bendigo Bank, SKM, the Wilderness Society and many more. She currently works with local governments, charities and community groups in Melbourne and Brisbane to teach non-profits how to tell their own stories powerfully and with the resources that they already have. She has a master's in communications focused on using social media for grassroots political organizing and a bachelor in journalism, and she recently completed community organizing training. Irina came to Australia with her parents as a refugee from the former USSR and lives in Brisbane with her mostly accommodating husband and two kids. Thank you so much for coming in to chat with us today, Irina. Before we get started, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our audience so you know who you're talking to. Our listener base is mostly comprised of amnesty activists. These are people who belong to an action group, whether it be a community group or a university campus group, and they're the ones who are doing all of the grassroots activism for our campaigns. They're getting out in the community and holding events and stores, getting people to sign petitions and writing letters. Our listeners also include Amnesty volunteers who do all of the behind the scenes office stuff like admin, event management, community engagement, supporter engagement, social and regional media, and all of the regional action centres. Our listeners also include people who are employed by Amnesty International Australia and people who just have a general interest in defending human rights. So let's get started. Could you begin by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure, I'd love to. So uh, my name is Irina B, and that is my uh, online name. Uh, and I run something called 44, Play, 44 Playbook that is the name of which is meaningless uh, because people ask me, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. The point of it is to uh, train nonprofits, community groups, activists and people who care about the common good and making our society better on how to share their messages, how to... Um, how to talk about the things they care about, how to uh, share the mission or whatever it is that they're passionate about with other people and, and tell their story in an effective way. And my background is I've worked in communications for about 25 years and I've been a communications manager for Volunteering Australia. I was the first communications uh, director for Clean Energy Council. I've worked for the Australian Red Cross Blood Service, the Queensland Community Alliance and a number of other organisations, City of Melbourne and and, um, some state governments and things. So I've just got a really broad experience running campaigns and um, having people ask me to convince other people (laughs) to do good things. (laughs) So when I first met you at a workshop that I was hosting, you discussed the six principles of persuasion that have been used for decades by businesses and marketers to get people to do something. Do you think you could perhaps start by explaining what these six principles are so that our listeners can utilize them, whether they're trying to influence someone to take action and sign a petition or volunteer at an event or even just convince someone to care about a particular human rights issue? You can't really, just to take that out, you can't convince anybody to do anything 
we are, at our core, the stories that we tell ourselves. So I don't know why human beings are the way they are. It's, it's a question that um, I think about quite a lot. And so I'm in a permanent state of existential crisis. But the, <laughs> the thing is, it's like, you know, we talk about this now moment, right? And the, the thing that I think is true is that human beings are the only animals, as far as I can tell from what I've read, that can imagine the future and remember the past like a movie. So we're constantly remembering our past and seeing that movie over and over, and that is informing who we are in the now moment and then imagining what our movie will be, you know, what, you know, back to the future to will be, you know, and, and that, that's what makes humans. So you can't con convince people of anything and you can't make them think or feel anything, but you can try and understand how, how those stories are made. And especially if you have a good or kind purpose, then it's useful to use these things. But obviously the other side use them too. The black hats use them as much as the white hats. They have way more money often and resources and a lot less scruples and you can see that playing around, playing out around the world. But this, this particular research, and I really like going back to the original source if I can. I don't necessarily read the book. I certainly own the book. And this is a, um, a, a book from the 60s by a guy called uh, Dr. Cal Caldini. And he was a psychologist. And another book I like is by a guy called Paco Underhill that was an anthropologist that studied how people shop. But this guy studied you know, how people, the psychology of influence, that's his book, Robert Caldini. And so he came up with the six principles and any marketing book you read now talks about it in one way or another. And any of those sort of um, webinars that you see, it starts off with the person talking a little bit about themselves and they will say, or let's say I will say, my background is that I'm, I'm actually a refugee. We came here as refugees from the Soviet Union. I came here with my parents when I was six years old and they were young adults and literally with the suitcase and the clothes on our backs. And, and the story that my parents tell is to leave the Soviet Union, you couldn't take more than basic jewellery that you could have on you and, five, and the equivalent of 500 American dollars. So my great-grandmother, when she left, had her ears pierced so that we could put gold studs in her ears. Everybody got their ears pierced. Now, when we got here, it seemed to be pointless to try and be changing these bits of gold, but, you know, that was the story. And now that's a really powerful story. So we all... So, so that... Um, and then people listening might relate to being an immigrant or they might relate to becoming something out of nothing. And that is that issue of... I suppose you could say similarity and something that I, I talk about a lot and um, a guy, Seth Godin, who I really enjoy listening to, talks about it. So people like us do things like this. People like us relate to people like this. So I tell my story about rags to riches or, you know, non-English speaker to writer as a way to make people f feel something. And hopefully, in their minds, they see my story and they see their own story. And that's that issue of similarity. So what you're trying to do when you're, you're trying to connect with people truthfully and authentically and honestly by telling a story that's honest, that hopefully they see it in their minds like a video, and then they see their own video and they see how those two connect. You know, that would be one way of doing it. Now, that sounds a bit complicated, but it's literally saying, hi, you know, I've joined Amnesty because I really care about people. You know, I grew up and there was this kid that was bullied at school and I thought, gee, well, people in political prisons are like being bullied. So, you know, I thought I'd join Amnesty. And then someone's like, oh yeah, I know a kid that was bullied or I was bullied. Yeah, I'm gonna come along to a meeting. Basic, it should be simple and honest. Um, this thing about consistency is that once someone does one thing, they tend to do it again, like, um, so if you, if, you, if you vote a certain way or believe a certain way or um, say you wear, oh, let's make it really simple. Say you wear red and someone says, someone you really care about says, wow, red looks really good on you. So forever and ever, you're going to go and look for red. You're not even going to remember why, but you're going to just go, oh, I really like red. Red's my favourite colour. And it's that sense of consistency. So how do you apply that 
um, uh, I guess, in, 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 in activism or, or campaigning, often when someone agrees to, that's, that's how we do subscriptions, you know, don't give me $100 at Christmas, give me $10 every month. That's consistency. And once you sort of give $10, you can say, we've well, given $10, do you mind, um, I don't know, adopting this goat or whatever it is the next thing. It's just sort of like, oh, I've done that. Well, I guess I'll do it again or I'll do it something similar. So, um, you know, well, I've gone to one rally. I guess I'll go to the next one. Or I helped out and I bought a dish or I made some lamingtons to sell at the school something or on campus, that sort of consistency. Author uh, yeah, Authority is pretty sta straightforward. Is people believe someone they trust, so and they believe someone who has some kind of. Uh, well, we used to believe in scientists, and we used to believe in doctors, and we used to believe in teachers. But that's sort of been questioned, and now there's sort of the authority of pop culture and this sort of like race to the bottom and the cor coarsening. The more sort of social media, um, the more social media, and the more of this sort of. Uh, public discourse that we have on Twitter, which is what it is, but it's not that we're all getting smarter and more sophisticated, it's we're all sort of getting coarser and rougher and meaner. And um, But we do put some people up on a pedestal, whether it's your mum or whether it's Kim Kardashian or whether it's the Prime Minister or whether it's your priest or whether it's someone else. So if you can find someone in authority, um, maybe it's a published author, and have them say your message, that works too. Celebrity, um, God forbid, Instagram inf influencer. Look, that works too. Like, so that, that's a good tactic is, um, you know, we see that a lot with um, sports people and mental health, you know, and, and that re weird juxtaposition that somebody who's so um, alpha and macho and powerful, um, you know, talking about something vulnerable. That's really powerful. And that, that works as well. So you can kind of subvert that authority, but you're still using someone that you trust and someone who is superior in some way. Um, consensus is about, again, this thing of all agreeing. So if you're surrounded by people that don't wear fur, uh, if you're surrounded by people that don't wear fur and you wear fur, then you'll kind of start to look at your fur differently as well. But it's about whatever's around you, you're gonna reflect that. So how do you do that? I guess you want to become the majority rather than the minority. You know, you want to be, um, you know, you want to become mainstream in some way. Um, I, don't, I don't really know how you do that specifically to your different organisation, but that's it. If everyone around me is doing it, that's the right thing to do. It's normalised. Um, I don't know, I think we're really seeing this in America. I'm really just following this whole Kavanaugh Supreme Court thing like, like it's a, a scary movie. And you just see that in American culture, and particularly in the 90s when I grew up, is this normalisation of treating women poorly and treating other people poorly. Um, reciprocity is basically helping each other. Human beings, we survive and aren't eaten by lions because we live in community and we make sure somebody is protecting us from the lions. So. Reciprocity starts with asking for help or giving help. Asking a favour, asking a question, or giving someone a sticker. Like, but lots of people do that. They don't. They don't ask for a donation. They give you a sticker, and then there's that connection is um, established, and then there's reciprocity. So, um, can you fill in this petition? Um, can you give this flyer to someone? Um, uh, do you mind sharing this post? Um, you know, asking for a favour creates connection and it can be very simple. And once the connection is established, you give, they give, you give, they give. And scarcity is also pretty straightforward, not enough of it. There's only 20 seats left. Uh, we're going to have this amazing authority speaker that's coming from another state, someone amazing. We've only got 100 seats. Um, we'll give the 100 seats, you'll get first go if you bring a friend, there's your reciprocity, there's your scarcity. Um, you get the consistency because when you bring a friend, you get um, that sort of community established and you're all sitting in a room listening to this person put, put a, an idea forward and if everybody's nodding, you're like, oh, well, maybe this must be true. So, and this also works in, this works in a good way and this works in a bad way. And one of the things that's coming to mind is the way they used to sell cigarettes 
which is doctors and cowboys. So, you know, <laughs> figures of authority, <laughs> like doctors and cowboys, smoking, saying it's fine and it's amazing. Um, or, uh, you know, this is a really old one, was smoking was sold to women as, as feminism, as independence. That was how smoking was sold to women. And in fact, the suffragettes in like turn of the century would all go walk down the street smoking. <laughs> you know, like, and in, in our country in our lifetime, you know, in black and white on ABC, you can see women chaining themselves to the pub bar so they can get a drink with the men because the women would have a separate bar. This was normal. This was in my mother's lifetime, right? So you'd have women in the 70s and they've got, they show it on the ABC season, right? Like with the perms from the 70s, right? Like Barbara Streisand perms, like in, in sort of like old school hot pants and no bras, like chaining themselves to the bar because they want a beer with their boyfriends. This is like your mum, my mum, you know, and and it's crazy to think about it. But then that, and then there becomes a consensus, like, yeah, why, why can't they go, you know? But first they've got to go in there and then the ABC gives them authority. Oh, they're on TV. Well, well I better listen to this, um, uh, you know. And, and, yeah, she's just like me. She looks just like me. She sounds just like me. I guess I'm like that woman. Maybe I should be having a beer with my boyfriend and not not just accept that I've got to go in the back room. These are weird fights, but they seem weird to us because it just seems bizarre. But in hopefully in 30 years' time, the idea of, like, using coal for electricity or, like, imprisoning 14-year-olds or something cr that we just think now is crazy will become the consensus, the majority. That's what we're fighting towards. And it takes a really long time, unfortunately. It was really great to hear Irina explain Robert Caldini's six principles of persuasion in the context of activism. Before moving forward, I thought it would be a good idea to just go over and summarize exactly what these six principles are for our listeners. So the first was similarity, and similarity is all about social proof. So people like to feel validated by doing something that they observe other people doing. And it's a principle that's based on the idea of safety in numbers. So, for instance, if your co-workers are working late, then you're probably more likely to do the same. If we note that a particular eatery is always full of people, we're probably likelier to give that establishment a try. We're even more influenced by this principle when we're unsure of ourselves, or if the people we observe seem similar to us. So, the next one is consistency. People want to commit to things that are consistently aligned with their values. As human beings, we have a deep need to be seen as consistent. Once we've publicly committed to something or someone, then we are so much more likely to go through and deliver on that commitment. Hence, consistency. This can sort of be explained from a psychological perspective by the fact that people have established that commitment as being in line with their self-image. So, for example... Even if a Republican didn't really like Trump, they're probably still going to vote for him because they identify and they've publicly committed as a Republican. The next one is authority. People in general have a tendency to obey figures of authority, even if those figures of authority are objectionable and ask others to commit to objectionable acts. It's simply because the average person will accept what a person with authority says without question. The next is consensus. The more you like someone, the more you're going to be persuaded by them. People want to share something similar with people that they like. So one example of consensus would be Instagram influencers. If you really like and admire someone, you're more inclined to buy a product or use a service that they recommend. This is because you want to share something similar with the people you admire. The next is reciprocity. Sometimes you have to give a little something to get a little something in return. Human beings are wired to basically want to return favors and pay back debts. Humans like to treat others the way they've been treated. And finally, there's scarcity. When people believe that something is in short supply, they want it more. Scarcity is defined by the perception of products seeming to become more attractive when their perceived availability is rather limited. Human behavior is such that we are likely to purchase something if we're informed that it's the very last one or that a special deal will expire soon. In short, people really believe that they'll be missing out on something that they have to have if they fail to act quickly. 
So those are basically the six principles of persuasion, which are a really great tool as an activist for you to utilize whenever you need to influence people. This might be something as simple as just influencing someone when you're having a conversation to sign a petition or figuring out how to word a particular Facebook post where you want people to buy tickets to an event, or even if you need to send out an email and influence more people to um, come and volunteer at your event. When we spoke to Irina, she also discussed with us ways that amnesty action groups across the country can build a better community of human rights defenders. So Irina, with all of your experience working with non-profits over the years, what advice do you have for amnesty activists looking to build a stronger sense of community amongst their supporters? Every individual has a different reason for, for doing what they do. So once again, you can't convince people, but I go back to listening to the kind of things that work and the kind of things that work is being, it's, it works sort of t- in two ways. So there's an, us and, there's an us and theming. So we all want to be part of community. We want to be included. We want to be loved. It's just sort of basic human nature. That's why loners, you know, that's why people who blow people up or like shoot people are often known as loners because, you know, people who have community don't normally act out that way. So when you're inside an activist community or you're inside a campaign, there's an us and then there's a them. And that's really powerful. And that's part of what keeps people doing it because there's an us and us is amazing. And then there's them and them is bad or whatever. So you're by growing the us a lot, it actually dilutes the value of it for the individuals. So one of the ways would be trying to keep smaller communities inside the bigger community. You know, like things that are cool become less cool when everybody starts wearing it. So trying to find that individual. So if somebody's shown interest, take it easy. Don't be pushy. Allow them to enjoy being part of the community and get pleasure in their way. Um, and for me, I do a lot of volunteering and I've done and I'm from uni, from school, I've always done volunteering because I really enjoy that feeling of us. Um, And now when I do volunteering, I suggest what I want to do. Like, this is what I'm good at, let me do this. I'm good at writing or I'm good at um, watching the social media or I'm good at making the picture or I'm good at making the brownies that we're all going to eat or I'm, I'm good at setting up the room or I'm good at calling my friends. Like, And then the other sort of volunteering I would do would be like, the stuff that I wanted to challenge myself with. So once I got comfortable, and particularly if you can create one-on-one relationships that become real friendships. So again, not easy and not quick. And the problem with, because, you know, I I was the volunteering um, Australia comms manager, is that volunteering is changing. So, uh, and blood donation, also volunteering, that's changing too. And there's a cultural difference between how, how, and I don't know what you call them, European-type cultures or WASPy-type cultures do things versus how different other ethnic groups do things. And so um, uh, tra- traditionally sort of this sort of English, Irish, Celtic, I don't, I don't even know what the right, whatever the right word is, I'm using it now, um, uh, th- that volunteering is usually to strangers or outside your own family group. But different ethnicities tend to volunteer inside the ethnic group. So like Africans or Italians or um, different Asian groups or, um, you know, you know, the uh, sort of Eastern Europeans or my culture where I come from, we, you know, we do lots of giving away free stuff, but inside our communities. So to be mindful of that, that different groups have different ways of giving and have a look around. I think about the parents um, at my school there's lots of kids whose parents don't speak English. Now, the parents' committees, the parents and friends or the parents and citizens' association, I've been a few times. It is very well, you know, people who speak really good English who are all, um, I don't know, white Australians, whatever the right word is, I'm using it, um, sitting around 99% women and that's really exclusionary. Like, if you're not used to that that that's not you that's them you know so thinking about that um can you go and talk to them inside their own group so if there's um if there's one person just get them to come to your party but if if there's like a group of i don't know malaysian women students that get together who are really community minded then go and talk to their group 
rather than have them come to your group and then let them do it in their way. Um, I'm just thinking back to at uni when I was involved with women's associations. Um, that's specifically uh, something that I remember. So let them do it in their way, in their group, and just give them the information or the connections or and just be the person that listens. That's one way of doing it. Um, the thing is people, you've got to express what the levels of commitment are. So you could say, actually, this if you sign this petition, we'll put you on the list, and then there might be some events that we'd like you to come to. The problem is that it's changed. So people say yes to Facebook, but that's a maybe. Like, that's not a yes. Whereas when you used to get an invite before Facebook, I know, it's crazy, um, I even started on a typewriter. So a rotary phone. And like when people said yes to an invitation, that was a hard yes, right? You got a piece of paper, you said yes, and you went in your diary and like the culture was, it would be a big deal to change your mind and say no. And you turned up on time because you didn't have any mobile phone, right? So like I came late today and I'm like, oh yeah, I'll just send them an email, it's no problem. People just didn't, people did do that, but not a lot. So that I think is really tough, you know, and um, I don't know, you've got to kind of be mindful when people say yes, you've, you've, got, you've got to follow them up with a phone call. Crazy. You have to ring people with mouths. <laughs> Like, I remember, like, I said to my kids, I go, put the phone near your ear. They're like, and they were spinning it around. They couldn't work out because they're just used to, like, talk, like looking at it. So you've got to so definitely when people say yes, you want to try and get their email address and or their mobile, and you want to make a physical connection with a human in a human way. Right? So if you want them to turn up physically, you've got to make a physical connection. And you only have to, maybe one person has three people each. And then each of those three people has three people each. So you, you know, you also don't want to overburden people who are volunteering. And in the end, people have got a lot more leisure time, but they'll only choose one or two or three things. So once they choose your thing, they've chosen your thing, you know, like, you know, if they're in Oxfam or in Amnesty or whatever they're in, that's the thing they're going to help with. But that, but if they say to you, I'm really involved in my church or I'm really involved in my sport or I'm really involved with my art, that doesn't necessarily mean they've actually got heaps of other time because people seem to get... Do you find that's true? I find that, that they, they don't just spread themselves out. They tend to, like, get into one thing and really go deep. So, I don't know, maybe... maybe um, yeah, and then the other thing would be... Um, surveys are really good. Like if you've got a list, I'd say definitely always grow a list. So get the emails, get the tech, get the phone numbers and try and find out what people are interested in with very short Google forms. Like a minute or two. Do you like this? Do you like this? Do you prefer weekends or weekdays? You know, try and get a sense of what your tribe or the tribe that you're trying to grow is, um, uh, you know, what what's good for them and then do your best to cater to it. Um, the other thing is cons like consistency, which is actually one of those um, one of those six sort of points. But you know, people say talk about posting. You should post every day. You should, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. But if you really like, if you really want people to um, become more involved, you consistently need to connect with them in a way that's personal. Like sometimes I get I'm on email lists and they they personally email me and I've never communicated with them. And they talk to me in this email as if we're friends and that's really jarring. So you must get those emails as well. Like, you know, and you're like, what are you talking about? What competition? I've never met you. What is this about? And then you get these rolling emails of like these sort of sort of salesy emails. You're like, no, I've never felt that way. I've never thought like that. This is weird. But then, and then sometimes I delete them. Sometimes I unsubscribe. So also thinking about, you know, what you're sending out. I mean, one of the sort of, um, it, it's, this is a bit salesy, but being really clear, depending on your resources, the less resources you have, and when I talk about resources, I mean people, money, time, the less resources you have, the more focused you want to be on your ideal recruit, customer, potential advocate. So, and there's lots of ways that you can do this. And it's the same way if you're writing a story, you write your character out. Is it a man, is it a woman? And it sounds weird, but you get really specific. Is it a man, is it a woman? How old are they? 
Um, what are their friends like? What are their hobbies like? You don't have to write this down. You can think it through. It's a lot easier to talk to someone very specific. Um, and to be honest, like back to those six terms, it's a lot easier to talk to someone just like you, right? And that's why you'll find these groups tend to be just like the leaders because it's a lot easier. As you get bigger, you can grow that. But the more resources you have, the more uh, different types of people you can target. But if you're only very small, just 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 target people just like you, for, for starters. Um, but be mindful of, like send, send regular things, but be mindful of where you got the names and whether people are paying attention and ask them and every now and again send a poll or a survey out, see if anyone's actually listening. Look at your stats on MailChimp. Are people actually opening things up? Send out scary emails every now and again. I'm about to drop you off the list. Do you want to be on it? And if you don't hear back, they don't want to be on it, right? Don't waste your time. Um, yeah, it's little things like that, if that's useful. People also really like talks. That's what I found. So when I run Green Drinks Brisbane, people don't want to come and chat pointlessly. They either want to date or they want talks, right? So singles night, speed dating, hear someone really different, Here's someone really interesting, meet someone who's made it, meet someone who's failed at it, you know, someone in a totally different culture, like hard to organise, but people are looking for something different. Like people are constantly looking for a new experience, young and old, you know, and that's hard because you've got to find it for them. Um, you know, the same, pl uh, this, it's a weird thing, like, I find with the events that I organise the same place and the same time is really good because it's a no, people don't have to think, where is it, what cinema, what place, but having something different at that venue really, really works. So there's things like politics in the pub, as long as it's the same pub, but it's different politics, you know, that kind of stuff. And if people don't have the capacity to utilise social media, what other platforms can they use to build their community? Yeah, right. Um, look, I have something that I call 88 Places Bingo. I actually brainstormed 88 places where you could promote your story and only a third of them are online. Like, online is a new thing and it blinds you to offline. So I'm happy to share that with you guys and you can put it up with this podcast and literally on one side is a whole list and the other side is a word search. <laughs> so that you can, like... <laughs> So you can find all those places and then find all those places. Um, and because, yeah, people forget, but pop-up stalls, um, if you – social – it depends. So it comes down to what you're trying to achieve and where you're trying to achieve it. If you're a local group in a local area, then um, – if, if you use up all your volunteer time having conversations on Facebook but your objective is to do a protest once a month, then, you know, you're not getting anywhere. This, this, this PNC that I was talking about, they have a meeting once a month at the school. It takes two hours. And for a lot of mums, I reckon that's the only two hours they've got a month. So rather than turn up at a meeting, why not webinar it or something? or uh, just send out the notes, or send out the notes and say, these are the 10 roles we need to fill. Uh, you've got two hours a month, fill this role, you know? So certainly do, if, uh, for a lot of social media that, you know, people might use up their volunteering time sitting on social media. So that's fine. Um, I think that, um, you know, you might say, you might just do a call out. That's why email's really good and phones and text. Um, if you have an email list, it's actually really easy to send an email, a group email. Just using your normal email and just put a, just either blind copy or put everyone in the to list if they know. Like, even my 89-year-old grandma knows how to use email, right, and can text me a photo. So that's pretty straightforward, old technology that's perfect. Anyone can send a text. Most people can download a message app, which I don't, it is social media, but it's not. It's more like a telephone tree. And older people in particular are very used to telephone trees. You know, you'd ring, if there was an, uh, like a, an emergency at school or something, you'd ring two people, they'd ring two people, like telephone tree, right? So using something like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, pretty much most people that have a computer or a smartphone have Facebook. I don't even have Facebook on my phone. I just have Messenger um, and the Pages app. 
And then you can just make a group. Um, I often suggest to, if it's if we're talking about older people in particular, to get their kid or their grandkid to do it for them. Because once it's set up, it's set up. So once that message is set up, it's done. Um, I would even do, say, uh, a closed group Facebook Live training on how to set up Twitter or Facebook or, or Messenger or anything else. Like, so if part of it is that they, there's two things, either they don't have the time or they don't know the tools. So you can do really simple trainings that they can run on YouTube. Most people know how to look at YouTube. Um, and then if they don't, you can do a training on how to look at YouTube. Like, and once that's set up, like that 10 minute training, it's done, you know, or just ask one of your friends to go and show them. That would be the easiest thing, right? Because actually the technology isn't meant to be hard. Your two year old can do it. My 89 year old grandma can do it. It's actually meant to be easy and then suck you in with all its crazy marketing psychology. So they use all those six things constantly to, to, to make you stay on it, right? So, but then there are these other things, um, photocopies, letterbox drops, um, pop-up stalls, farmer's markets, uh, posters at the supermarket. I've, I've used that quite a lot where you just make a poster by hand, photocopy it at the library, put up a poster at the library, you know? Like, the, it depends where the people are that you're trying to get. If they're local to your community, actually, actually, social media is not great because social media is global and you're just trying to get people that are local. Um, uh, when we're trying to sell uh, my daughter's Girl Guide cookies, a poster on the front of the school door with my daughter in her guide uniform with a bucket of cookies did the trick, sold them all in an hour, you know? So... Um, the solution has to fit the problem. So if the problem is global, go on social media. But if the problem is local, then the marketing is old school. What I want to add is that you can't change people's minds with facts. Mm. That's really important. You can only change people's minds incrementally with feelings. So like it or not, people make a decision based on feelings and then they find reasons why they've made that decision. And that's back to the consistency, right? Why did you buy that car? Because it was the safest, because it was the cheapest, because it was the most energy efficient. No, because I liked it was red. That's it. But people can't think that for themselves because that seems frivolous. So people make a decision that's based on emotions and gut and then ascribe logic to it. And so if you want people to come with you, and you, it's good to unpack your own decisions. You know, you're going, oh, well, I, I'm helping Amnesty because I care about X, Y, Z. And maybe that's true, I don't know. But there's an emotion behind it. And so how can you make people feel? I mean, when you do those sort of um, adopter, adopter child kind of things, they don't adopt the village, which is where the money goes. We all know it goes to the village. They adopt the child. When there's some horrible thing happening, they don't show you, you know, they don't show you the dozens of horrible, you know, the, the, the tragedy that's happened. They show you the bloody teddy bear in the corner because it's that kind of very individual, personal connection. So making personal, real, genuine connections that are genuine for you, you know, it, it's taxing, but it takes you but then you get this amazing friendship out of it you know like um it, but it and it takes time but i i find, found that that i've um when i've when i've been out there sort of campaigning um when you're real with people and share what's really going on with you like you know it hurts me that i look at my kids that are so free and and wonderful and, and able to explore the things they enjoy, like singing and dancing, with my kids particularly, no ball, no playing ball at our house. But, you know, they, they, and I just think about a little kid somewhere else. And I imagine my kid growing up, you know, I've been to Bali for holiday and I remember driving and I've been to Numea and I remember going into the town away from the resort. And then sometimes I remember that. And then I think about my kid there and I just, you know, like, it, it, it stops me. It makes me want to do something. So sometimes it's really powerful to show one of those movies, you know, like Netflix has got loads of them, especially around food and 
drugs and the way the systems work. Show the movie, show Inconvenient Truth, show whatever those movies are around women women in prison or all, some of those things we've all seen, the injustice around it. I've been listening to that amazing podcast, Serial, you know, number three, and, you know, Dirty John and there was another one that I've just listened to, Dr Death. You know, it, it moves people. Show it, play it, and then have a conversation, have an open discussion. Don't expect everyone to join, but get that emotion to happen in a personal way and have it be personal for you and... Um, you can't help but move people because most people, in fact, all people that I've met, except, I have to be honest, the odd one or two, most people are fundamentally good and kind and want to do the right thing. And as long as it doesn't encroach too much and they're not, they're not going to feel awkward and feel uncomfortable saying no, they want to help. They want to be part of... They want to be something part of something bigger, bigger than their own problems more important than what they're going to have for lunch. They want to leave their mark on the world and um, make it better. It was really great to hear what someone with so much experience teaching not-for-profits had to say about how we can better build a sense of community and activism. Something Irina said that I found particularly interesting was the importance of ensuring that your activists are getting what they want out of their volunteer or activist experience. And this kind of goes back to that principle of reciprocity. To really grow that sense of community, you have to focus on making meaningful connections and not just looking at increasing numbers. If you're an organiser, this involves spending some quality time in small groups connecting with your activists, especially new activists, to ensure that they feel supported and empowered. You can connect with other activists over coffee, after a group meeting, or whilst protesting together. Something else that Irina said, which I completely agree with, is that the effectiveness of offline media is often, often overlooked when connecting with new activists. I think that a lot of emphasis these days is placed on social media and connecting with activists online, which is great, but it's important to remember that there are other ways you can connect with people. And sometimes a face-to-face -face interaction is really meaningful. In my own personal experience, my social media feeds are often inundated with content and important posts from communities that I'm involved in get lost. As Irina pointed out, there are so many options with offline media. These include posters, letterbox drops, brochures, etc. And this might be a little bit off topic, but I think I'd like to end with an analogy that Irina spoke to us about, which unfortunately we didn't actually get to record. But I think it's something to bear in mind in particular when you're perhaps talking to people who just don't agree with you or they have a completely different mindset. Um, and next time you're getting frustrated, maybe just like take a minute and think of it from this perspective. And it was this idea that there are two kinds of mindsets. Um, there are people with an abundance mindset or a scarcity mindset. And I know from my own personal experience that I'm the type of person with an abundance mindset. And I'm sure that a lot of people involved with amnesty are probably the same. But someone like my dad, who grew up overseas in a completely different time, is definitely someone who has a scarcity mindset. The best way to think of it is that people with a scarcity mindset envision society as having a pie. And this pie represents all of the different social and economic benefits that you get from living in a society. And people with a scarcity mindset think that there's only so much pie. And when we fight for the rights of a particular group and we allow them to have access to this pie, then that means there's less pie available for them. People like me with an abundance mindset realize that there's not a limited amount of pie. As humans, we have the potential to continue to create more and more pie and feed more and more people within our society. Sometimes when you're talking to people with this scarcity mindset as someone with an abundance mindset, it can be really, really frustrating. But you have to realize that people have these different mindsets based on different factors from when or where they grew up and their own personal experiences. And like Irina discussed, their own story that has shaped who they are and how they view society. Anyway, thank you so much for tuning in to our third episode of the Activist Connect podcast. Thanks, guys. We hope you tune in next fortnight.